Good morning, church. Welcome. We're glad that you're here today. Pentecost Sunday, when uh, uh, the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles and, uh, and were, they were filled with God, God himself, through the Holy Spirit. And um, I was thinking this week, um, uh, what an awesome, what an awesome gift not just salvation, but that we have the Holy Spirit. And um, I'd like to just read in Acts chapter 2, it starts in verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, um, I look back on uh, the life of this uh, body of believers and in my own life. And I think, God has been so faithful, so faithful. So let's stand and sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not, as thou hast been, thou forever will be. Pardon for sin. 
Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Cone. What a great truth in that great song. A couple of things I want to remind you of. First of all, if you're new here, we're glad you're here. In fact, you bless me more than you know. That is a fact. And I, I just, I'm thrilled every week to, to meet some folks. So uh, we want you to text that number you see on the screen, and, and uh, there you can go to simnaz.org. And uh, not only leave us your contact info so we can get in touch with you, you'll find out more about us because that's our official page, and there's even more there to learn. There's links to other things that you might want to uh, follow. And there's a great picture of Travis there, and you can just print that out on your little home printer and put it up in your house. That'd be nice. Did you know, did you know that Travis is, he's our youth pastor, for those of you who didn't know, there's a book out that's a uh, hundred things to do with youth, and they thought they had the ultimate guide to youth ministry. Ha! Huh. Travis has found more things that are in a book of a hundred things to do with youth, including uh, joining tennis tournaments. Yes, that's right. If you're proud of Travis, uh, raise your right hand. Yes, the left hand went up. <laughs> his left hand went up because he wore out his right hand serving I'll tell you what, he's good, but uh, his, his young son, whew, you've done a good job keeping the old man in the game. <laughs> hey, I, and I say that literally because, were you the oldest guy there? No. Oh, really? He should have been in the senior bracket, but he was playing with these guys, and the kids he was playing against weren't winded. They weren't breathing hard, so he went over to the net and said, you know, the least you guys could do would be to breathe hard when I'm trying to play against you. That's true. That, that's true. <laughs> And they wouldn't. So you know what he did? He smashed the ball at the net and hit one of them in the chest, knocked him down. They had to call an ambulance. No, that, that part. He did hit one of the young guys, taking, a, taking advantage of the young guys. But anyway, I'm proud of the old guy for hanging in there. More, more news. <laughs> Moving right along. Vacation Bible School is at the door. My, I'm telling you, it's going to be so much fun. And uh, we want you to be praying for our students and for our workers and love on them when you get a chance. Let them know how much you appreciate them doing this ministry. And uh, teach the kids about being created in Christ and designed for God's purpose. You know, He has a purpose for your life. I don't know what you're doing. I don't, I don't know what you think your life's purpose is, your goals, and where you're headed in life. But God has a purpose and a plan for you. You're not a mistake. He has a plan for you. We're going to have fun talking about, the, about that with the kids. Then Saturday, June 18th, our fun run and prayer walk. Now, this is coming up quick, but you have 13 days to go from couch potato to a 5K champion. There's a plan to go at, do it in 30 days, but you're going to have to speed it up a little bit now. You've got 13 days, and we'll have the ambulance on speed dial. You'll be fine. And then today, today, board members, at 2 o'clock, we're meeting by the first room off the kitchen back here, having our board meeting today at 2 o'clock. Hope you'll be there. I hope I'll be there. <laughs> Somebody call and remind me. Today, 2 o'clock, a board meeting. That said, let's uh, worship the Lord today. And thank you for coming, every one of you. I appreciate it so very, very much. God bless you. Amen. I'm a bit of a Nancy Nazarene, and I take a nap on Sunday afternoons. I'm not sure who decided, but anyway, I'll be there. Let's all stand together. Let's uh, praise the Lord together. Let's raise a hallelujah. a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies yes, I, know. I raise a hallelujah louder than my unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is
even in the storm, even when we're in pain, even though we're in, we're struggling. God, I thank you so much that you fight for us, that you love us still, that you are, you surround us, even when we don't understand some of life's journey, even though it's hard sometimes. I thank you that in the midst of all that, you are so present in our lives through your Holy Spirit, and I thank you for that gift. I thank you that even though prices rise, skyrocket, gas, groceries, everything, it's higher. But the price that you paid for salvation was once and for all, and it is a free gift. It's still free for us today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for salvation. We ask these things in your son's name.
just have to testify for just just a, a moment this morning. Um, first of all, we just, uh, Kevin and I just want to thank all of you, our church family, for such amazing support and love and prayers and texts during a really tough time when we lost two baby twin grandsons. You know, so many of you in this room have been through some really rough times too, and I can see your faces. first, I really, really struggled spiritually. I didn't understand, and I was angry. I was so angry. It's so hard to see your kids go through that, and you can just imagine. And I think one of the things that helped me so much was the fact that God himself sent his son to die for us. And what a sacrifice that was for each of us. And there were days that all I could do was, I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to read my Bible, and I'm just going to trust you. And God has just revealed himself to me in ways I never thought possible. He's revealed, I know, plans for my daughter and her husband as they minister to others and as we go through these really tough times some phases of our lives some valleys God is preparing us he he is and Grace and I were talking about that this morning he's preparing us he's growing deeper roots in us and so while Uh, It's tough. I'm thankful. I'm so thankful for what he's done. And um, this last song is just a testament of where, you know, he just, he will hold you through life's uh, trials and troubles. And he'll hold you fast. When I feel my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail he will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold Oh, 
pray with you this morning and uh, just add just a word, if I may, to Denise's testimony. I had uh, talked mostly with Kevin, I guess, and and uh, I had a, <clears throat> I don't know what to call it, but just an intense have to know. Um, Kayla's boys' his names. And uh, it's like I could pray for them, but without their names, I just felt like something was missing. Kevin shared with me the, their names, Levi and Simeon, and uh, that just changed everything in my praying for them. And this is not about me. Don't misunderstand. It's not like I'm super spiritual or anything, but it's just about the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to preach about this morning. And So it seems right to share this with you. But in praying through the Holy Spirit, I I felt so present with those babies. It was like we were in the same room with one another spiritually. Not to say physically so that I could hold them, but there was a spiritual connection like I think I've only experienced once before in interceding for a baby. And it was very, 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 very real. In fact, I would say it was more real than being here with you today. It was eternally real, if, if you understand what I'm saying. And, uh, and when, they, when they passed, and I, I continued to pray for them, each of them, until their last. And uh, when that time ended, it's like the Lord spoke to me just two more names or words, if you will. And I think because they were twins, I got two words, laughter and joy. And it's, it's like if it was a book, you'd be turning the pages of their life and you get to the last page, there was laughter and there was joy. I'm so glad for the way God works. I don't know what you need in your life today, but, but I want you to know God is real and He's present. He has a plan for your life. He has, a, he has your future mapped out. I just want you to know you can trust Him. Father, as we come to you today, we're glad for your blessings. I will never experience laughter and joy the way I used to. I think whenever I think of those two words or experience them, I'll think of Levi and Simeon. I don't know why some lives, though they're eternal, their time on this world is cut so short. Others live so wonderfully long and are blessed and create memories and blessings and family and there's so much to enjoy. But I know that you know and and your purpose is fine. It's perfect. It's complete. I do not doubt your purpose. I'd agree with the parents and grandparents. We don't understand why, but we're in agreement with you. You know best. And Lord, today someone here is probably struggling. Maybe they've got doubts and fears and frustrations. And certainly, Lord, certainly the folks in these various communities we've heard about in the last week or so with shootings and, and hatred and malice. And innocent people die because someone else is living in darkness. The message today, Lord, has to do with with your church intervening in this dark world. And Lord, we need to be filled again with the Holy Spirit to be encouraged and empowered to go out day by day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, and maybe moment, second by second, and confront this darkness So help us to be paid up and prayed up and ready to go up. And in the meantime, while we're here, may we intervene and intercede for this world. Help us, Lord, to be mindful that people around us, all around us, maybe every day, need Christ. They need the presence of God through the Holy Spirit that we enjoy so much. May we be a a conduit, a vessel from you through us to them. 
speak to our hearts today in this message. May we be encouraged by it and strengthened, and may you be honored in every bit of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is great to be here, that is for sure. And God bless you extra well. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to Acts chapter 1, and mostly we're preaching uh, from chapter 2, but there's just this little bit in chapter 1 I'm going to repeat. This is what I preached last year, I mean, not last year, last week. It seems like a year ago sometimes. Ah, last week. And um, let's start with this in, in chapter 1, uh, verse 6. They asked the question, Lord, at this time will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And, uh, and that, is, that is the change, the change that started a, a whole new era in the kingdom of God. The coming of Jesus was one thing, but the coming of the Holy Spirit has been more lasting. It has been up to our days and in our days and to this day and in our, in our souls. God, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, is with us. Amen. So Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now, not all of your Bibles, because of different translations, has the word fully. But I guarantee you it's either there or implied there. When it had fully come, they were all together with what in one accord in one place. I'm glad that word fully is there because... With that word inserted, it gives me the idea that God has been waiting for that very moment. At, at that time, it was 4,000 years in the waiting. Can you imagine how patient God is? That He didn't jump the gun. That He waited until that day had fully arrived. I, I read a little bit about that word fully in the Greek, and uh, it was used sometimes of ships being loaded with cargo. And when they were fully loaded, they would set sail. There wasn't room for one more box. There wasn't room for one more sailor. It was fully loaded, completely. So time had been fully measured out. Everything that needed to happen had happened, and it was now, according to God's perfect will and plan, the perfect time, the perfect day, the perfect hour to send His Holy Spirit. We may never, never, ever know the deep, deep love of God. But when I read that God's Word about the gift of His Son sent to die for us, and then I read about the gift of the Holy Spirit that He had promised us, given to be with us and through us and in us, to help us forever. It realizes just another level of God's love for us. That He wasn't uh, pleased just to um, send His Son to save us. There was something more. He wanted to fill us. He didn't want to just say, okay, you're cleansed and set us like a, an empty cup back on the cupboard. But he wanted to, us to be filled with his presence. What a wonderful, wonderful gift of God. Think of this. When Adam and Eve sinned, God drove them from the garden so that they couldn't eat from the tree of life. Later, however, he sent his son Jesus to die for us so we could be born again and have eternal life. But he added to that gift of eternal life his presence the Holy Spirit of God, so that we could not only live forever, we could live right for, forever and guided and encouraged by God Himself. So when that day, the day of Pentecost, had fully come, the Holy Spirit came. And the Bible tells us, as you read on, you find out that it was audible. Now, think about this. In our day, when we're in a great service and somebody's praying and they're born again 
and the Holy Spirit comes on a person, <clears throat> we don't see the Holy Spirit. Other than the person crying or shouting or whatever, we don't hear the Holy Spirit. He's not here in a tangible form like Jesus was so that you can reach out and touch the Holy Spirit. But there was a sound from heaven. Make no mistake, this was not a, a climactic change in the atmosphere. This was a sound from heaven. It sounded like, and it was not a wind, but it sounded like a rushing mighty wind, a tornado. It was loud. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. In fact, we're going to find out as we read on, it not only filled the house, it filled the town. I'm sure you've heard the roar of some loud winds. This was pretty incredible. This was loud, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Not only was it audible, it was visible, a visible coming of the Holy Spirit in this. <clears throat> there appeared to them uh, tongues of fire that were divided and, and uh, set on each one of them, something they could see. Ask myself this question. At the coming of the Holy Spirit that first time, why was there an audible experience and a visible experience? Something they could hear, something they could see. Why was that? Well, allow me to um, begin to answer that question by asking another question. Why was Jesus' ascension to heaven visible? In prior times when Jesus appeared... He didn't knock on the door, and they opened the door, and they said, oh, Jesus, come on in. He just appeared. Like you can imagine in, in, uh, in, in movies and something, somebody just appears. You're standing here talking to somebody over there, and suddenly there's somebody else right there. They just appear, And he left the same way. He just disappeared. He didn't go to the door and say, well, I'll see you all later. Goodbye. And they watched him walk away. No, he disappeared. He vanished much like we would think of that of a, as a ghost. <clears throat> so why were they privileged to watch him rise up into the sky, rise so high until a cloud blocked him from their sight? I don't believe any of us would ever be discouraged by clouds and rain, but I think those boys were saying, oh, that cloud! He was right there. Oh, I hate those clouds. <laughs> I don't think they said that. But they were watching him, and, and this is the other thing, we don't know. How fast did he ascend? I don't know. I, I don't think supersonic fast. I think just quick enough they couldn't jump up and grab him, but slow enough that they could see him for a little while. Why did they get to watch him go back into heaven? The answer is not given in the Bible. So you are free to use your imaginations and think it through. Come up with an answer of your own. I'd love to hear what you think. Here's what I think. It's because in prior times when he disappeared, they had no idea where he went or if he'd come back or when he would come back. He was just gone, and they were left puzzled. He had already told them that he was going to go to his father and he was going to prepare a place for them and he'd come back later and get them and take them home to be with him forever. But this time, they got to watch him go, I think, to solidify in their hearts and in their minds, he's really gone to heaven to be with his father. I think it just filled in the blanks for him. If he had been standing there on the hillside that day and just disappeared, like pr prior times, they might have thought, oh, he'll just appear again somewhere. Let's go back to the house. He'll show up again. No, he's really gone this time. He's really gone into heaven. This time they saw him leave, and it added an element of permanence about that. All right. So why um, does that have anything to do with the Holy Spirit coming? Again, when the Holy Spirit comes on the church in these days, and somebody in a meeting, we don't hear the mighty rushing wind. We don't see something that looks like fire above their heads. It's because we don't need it now. We, we have testimonies by faith that the Holy Spirit of God has and does come on people. But those guys had no, no experience of that. Nothing to say, well, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on you? So God gave them another gift, an audible thing, a visible thing. So they got to see this and know this really is the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
<coughs> this is not just an emotional experience. This is really real. God is really doing something here. I can hear it. Boy, it's really loud. I can see it on your head and your head and your head and your head. Whoa, there's one on my head too. Look here. It gave them something concrete to say, this is the promise of God. Now, since their days, we have the testimonies from them to the next generation and the next and the next and the next until we, we know by faith this is what the Bible says will happen and people have testified to it forever and ever and ever. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, I'm sure you undoubtedly feel a change in your heart. You, you definitely know that God is speaking to you and He's done something within you. And on that day of Pentecost, they really knew that there really was the Holy Spirit and they could really hear something different and they could really see something different. Not just an emotional experience, Something was happening, and there were real results. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, or your Bible might say languages, it's, it's properly understood as languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them utterances. In other words, He gave them the words to say. I think that's true even to our day. If we're patient... And, and if, we're, if, if we're in an attitude of prayer, I'm going to give you this hypothetical situation. Somebody just called you with terrible news, bad news, awful, awful news. And what do you say? I'm always, not always, I too often blunder into something and I, I, I mean well, but I just don't say the right thing. But sometimes I think if we'll just pray a minute and listen and wait for the Holy Spirit, what, let God light, lead and, and let Him give us the utterance, the, the right things to say. Isn't that awesome? When, when the Holy Spirit leads us in the right things to say, He was giving them the words to say. Why did God want to give them the ability to speak in other languages? Well, because at that time, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, it was there, this was the moment, there just happened to be, in Jerusalem at that time, Jews, devout men, here's the key, from every nation under heaven. Wow. Some of them were proselyte Jews, that, that is to say they weren't born a Jew or a Hebrew, they joined the Jewish tradition or religion. They became Jews in that respect. And they're from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, probably like a siren or something that was really, really loud in the neighborhood, it demanded everyone's attention. And when this sound occurred, the multitudes heard it from all around the city, and they came running to where it was coming from. That room right there where all those crazy Galileans have been staying. What's going on? They were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. They were amazed and marveled, saying, Look, are not all these men who speak Galileans, country boys, rednecks? Not a lot of learning, like Oklahoma. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm sorry, God forgive me, and you too. I wouldn't have said that if I hadn't seen you sitting there. That's just a fact. But, but they were, you get the idea. They were Galileans. They, they weren't like highly, highly educated people. How on earth is this happening how do we hear that each, each one of us hears our own language that we were born to? And they list the countries here. Why, there's Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene and from Rome. Let me read that to you in modern countries, can I? Picture the, the worst, most Volatile places in, Amer in, in the world today. There are people from Iran, from Iraq, from modern Iraq and, and Syria, from Turkey, from Rome. I mean, they just kind of list all the hot spots where everything's happening, where, where you might suspect a war could break out at any time. 
And the, then he lends, uh, mentions Cretans from, from Crete. Paul writes about people from Crete, and he says, even their own poets say they're all liars. Isn't that something? What a testimony about people. And there's a, even people from there. We're here, and, and we're hearing the gospel. We hear them speaking in our own languages. Interestingly enough, if you look at the travels of, of Paul and the church, wherever the, the apostles went, it's listed there. It's where they took the gospel. It's like these people came to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost to worship this high holy day, and, and they heard the gospel. They went back home, and they'd say, you'd never believe what's happening over in Jerusalem. Why, why the, the presence of God came on these crazy guys from Galilee, and they all began to speak in our own languages. We know they didn't learn them because they're not real bright boys, but they, they were speaking clearly the gospel, the good news of the mighty deeds of God, and, and they just spread the gospel in that respect everywhere they went. So then, days later, years later, when, when the apostles were going out preaching, people had already heard about this. Isn't that amazing that God had a plan, and, and He got the Word going without the Internet? That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what? And, and this, is, this, is the, this is the impetus of the message today. This is what really got me excited about it. They asked an amazing question. What could this mean? Has, has anything ever happened in your life that you thought maybe God was working or He should have been? And, and, and have you ever asked the question about some big event like, what on earth is going on? What is this all about? What is God doing? And generally, we ask that when, when we feel like God has been silent. What could this mean? I'll tell you what it could mean. It could mean that the work of animal sacrifices is complete. Because the blood of, of bulls and goats never could wash away our sins. But this same Jesus whom you have crucified is now proven to be both Lord and Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the chosen one of God. It could mean that now that Jesus' work on the cross is complete, we now live in a new dispensation, a new time of grace, a time that uh, God has come to live with us and in us through His Holy Spirit. It's this Holy Spirit that has made all of this change noticeable in our lives. It is the Holy Spirit who brought this audible sound from heaven. He also brought these visible flames that rested on us. It's this Holy Spirit of God that's given, to, given us the ability to tell you the good news of God without fear and, and to do it in your own language so you can clearly understand what God is doing in our lives and wants to do in your life so that you'll know that the truth of the kingdom of God that is here and now and present with us, not just them in that day, but here and now today this morning. That's what it could mean. It could mean that your days of loneliness are over. It could mean that you can know God personally. It could mean that uh, God can fulfill your empty, broken heart. It could mean that you can live a purposeful life that really makes a difference here and now. It could mean that you have eternal life. It could mean that you, you have a clear testimony that God loves you and is working in your life. It could mean that God again wants to dwell like He did with Adam and Eve with us. That's what it could mean. And, and then there's this little phrase. It always, it's, it always acts like a speed bump to me. When the Bible's on a roll and good things are happening, and then it says, others... Dun, dun, dun. Others began mocking. They're saying they're full of new wine. I'm sure you've probably been mocked about something in your life, made fun of over something. I, I hope it wasn't because of your faith in Jesus, but it happens. Isn't it kind of odd that it's okay if you believe in God? Just don't talk about Jesus much. And, and if, you have to ha if you have to mention Jesus, just don't get too excited about it. Don't ever suggest that there are sins in this world and that people commit them. Or um, don't ever suggest that your sins are washed away and that your heart is cleansed. People don't like that. Or, or if you want to believe in Jesus, you have to at least agree that we all live in sin anyway. 
what a difference it makes to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, having His Holy Spirit living in us. What a, what a change that brings to a person's life. What a different kind of testimony that is. You start talking about the Holy Spirit, people want to call somebody to take you away. I, I liked what I told you last week about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. I just want to repeat this in case somebody might have missed this because I thought this was really good. In, in the old days, a, a teacher by the name of Nicander um, w- was teaching. And, and he said that to make a pickle, the vegetables should be first dipped. Remember I told you that, that they called it bapto, dipped. Uh, it had, the fruit had to be dipped into boiling water. That was called bapto. But there was baptized, a little different word, similar word, both were verbs, and, and both concerned the immersion of the vegetable into a solution. The first being dipped into water was only temporary, but the second act of baptism is, is going to produce a permanent change when it's dipped in vinegar, and something is set within it, and it's changed forever. Peter was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and he was changed Forever. He went from being a cautious follower of Jesus, thus he denied him three times, to being a bold believer, taking his stand to preach to a crowd of thousands and not caring about what people thought. He took his stand with the, other, the others behind him as, a, as a, a choir of preachers shouting, Amen! Preach it, Peter! Sick him, boy! You're doing good! <laughs> And they were encouraging him to preach the word. And he raised his voice, and this is what he said. In these last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons will prophesy, and your daughters, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And when the time comes, I will pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women, both And they'll prophesy, and I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red before that tremendous and marvelous day of the Lord. That was a reference to the second coming of Christ that will come, I believe, sometime shortly after the rapture of the church. And whoever calls out to God for help, the Bible says, will be saved. That's good news. That's a good sermon right there, Peter. What else do you have for us? He went on to say, fellow Israelites, listen carefully to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man thoroughly accredited to you by God himself. How was that? Through signs and miracles and wonders. And all of these things were done through him in their common knowledge. This Jesus, following the deliberate and well thought out plan of God, was betrayed by men who took the law into their own hands. And he was handed over to you, and you shouted, crucify him, crucify him, and you nailed him to a cross. But God untied the ropes of death and raised him up. Isn't that good news? You did your best, and Satan did his best, but the same God who gave him the authority to die for our sins also gave him authority to be raised again. I'm glad we don't worship today a a dead hero. I'm glad we don't have a monument. I'm glad there isn't a place where we go to leave flowers every Memorial Day. We have a risen Savior who's alive and well today. Death was no match for him. David went on to say, I saw the Lord always before me, for he's at my right hand, and so I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart will be glad, and my tongue will rejoice, and my body will also live in hope. Do you realize he's saying here and now? In this life, no matter how bad things get, I can have hope in my life for now. This isn't my best life yet. The best is yet to come. God has a better deal for us waiting, and I can't wait to get to heaven. Oh, it's a struggle that some days. Do you ever wake up doing this? Oh, come today, Lord Jesus. Please come today. Men and brethren, he said, let me speak freely to you. David He was born and he died. His tomb's right over there. I'm paraphrasing a bit. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of the body, according to the flesh, that he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. 
Amen. Jesus is alive and well. And, and all of that came to be and it happened. And God raised him up of which you are all witnesses. He's, he's seated at the right hand of God. Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. God sent his son to die. He did. He was buried. He raised again. He went to heaven. And now he sent his Holy Spirit that you can now see the results. You can hear the results. You heard the sound. Now you're seeing us boldly proclaiming the word of God. Verse 36, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Wow. Why would God do all of that for us? To, to bring us hope so that when angry sinners kill your sons and daughters in the hallways of hospitals or in the safety of a school, you can have hope that they too will live again with Christ and that they'll have an eternal life in heaven with their loving Heavenly Father. Jesus came to life and He gives us hope and the Holy Spirit comes to comfort and guide our hearts when terrible things happen in this world. I got the idea too late. But the day I thought about it, I thought, oh, man, I'd have paid the 450 in gas if I could have just drove down to Uvalde, Texas, just to stand on a street corner and pray. I wish so much I'd have got that idea sooner. I wish I could have gone and, and offered the hope of God and, and pray and offer them Jesus alive and through the Holy Spirit being with us right now and just bring some comfort to somebody. I wish that we could be around every time and, and, and bring salvation to a sin-darkened soul that would murder people in a hospital. Do you realize that, that both of the perpetrators of the crimes that you've heard about recently, and, and all of them, do you realize that somewhere in their life, undoubtedly, someone testified to them, someone invited him to church. Someone invited him to a Sunday school. Someone invited him to a vacation Bible school. Somebody probably prayed for them. They had that opportunity and they rejected it. Or, or if they did attend church, if they did say, pray for me, it just didn't take hold. Do you know that you, you know somebody somewhere today who needs you to pray for them? I'm glad to tell you this on the front end. I hope this never, ever, ever, ever happens in our state, much less in our town. But I want you to know, if there are terrible things that happen in your life, <clears throat> it's not because God doesn't care. It's because somebody rejected Jesus. You know, there's somebody right now who might have those kind of crazy thoughts in their head, and they need you to be full of the Holy Spirit and ready to, to intercede, to, to have an intersection, a junction with them in their life and say, wait, listen to God, listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to the Bible, hear what the Lord can do for you and bring you out of that darkness of your thinking. We don't need to get rid of guns in America, we need to get rid of sins in people's hearts. We don't need to change the Second Amendment. We need to live by the Second Commandment to love people as, as ourselves. We need to help people to realize that if they would just love somebody rather than hate them and think, think of ways to get back at somebody else by killing someone else and instead just live by the Second Greatest Commandment, oh, we wouldn't have these kind of sins. We wouldn't have these kind of rampages. We wouldn't have these headlines. Somebody, I don't know what the full story was. Somebody asked um, uh, Senator Cruz from Texas why we have so many mass killings in America, and I don't know what his answer was. But mine was pretty simple, because we have sinful people. Sinful people need a Savior. And it doesn't matter how dark their heart is or how far they've gone. The Holy Spirit of God is present with us in our lives and through the church, through Christians, to bring conviction to people around us and to say, your heart needs forgiveness. Your heart needs the light of God. Your heart needs a healing, a spiritual healing from the Lord Jesus. Why was Jesus sacrificed if not to save the most wicked and the most lost and the most broken so that dark hearts might see the light of God and be drawn to the, to the Lord God. That's what we need so very, very much. 
Paul wrote to Timothy, and just see if this doesn't sound like the world today, but know this, that in the last day, perilous times will come. And sadly, a lot of families in our nation are experiencing these perilous times when it's just not safe to send your kids to school. That's peril. Perilous times will come because men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money and boasters and proud and blasphemies, blasphemies, <laughs> blasphemers and disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And it's not just the violent, wicked people. Because I see this too in the phony religious fakes who the Bible says having a form of godliness but deny its power. They deny the power of the Holy Spirit to work in them and change them and to change the people they're <clears throat> preaching to. Denying the power of God to cleanse hearts from sin and denying the power of God that can change lives forever. So therefore, what we really, really need is we need the church to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God so that we will have God's power to let God's light shine in a sin-darkened world so that people could come to God and leave their hate behind. At the end of last winter, I was preaching to you a series about Jesus sending out his disciples. And, and that whole series was, was just leading up to the idea that Jesus was headed to Jerusalem and continuing to minister every step of the way. And, and first he sent out 12 disciples to preach to all the towns and villages around him. And then he sent, uh, when they came back and reported, he sent some more out. This time he sent 72 disciples out. And in both of those cases, he told them to do three specific things. First, for their sake, and to keep things easy, wherever you're invited to stay with someone, stay there. Don't go from house to house to house to house trying to find a better deal. Just eat or drink whatever they serve you and be content with that. Secondly, heal the sick. Third, preach about the kingdom. And he'd already given them plenty of material. He gave them the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm hoping they were taking notes. Preach about the kingdom of God that the kingdom of God is near them. And if they reject this preaching, if they reject you, when you leave town, shake the dust off your sandals in a, in a testimony to them. But when you do, be sure you turn one more time and remind them, remind them, the kingdom of God is near. Here's an interesting thought. I may be wrong, but I, I don't think so. We'll never change this world. This world is in a crash, collision course with the judgment of God. However, however, we can preach to people that the kingdom of God has come and is near to them, and all they have to do is, is it by faith say yes to Jesus, and, and the Holy Spirit will come into their hearts and lives and change them forever. And while we may not change the whole world, we can help a few at a time, one at a time, some come into our lives, and as we speak to them, we can help them exchange this world for the kingdom of God, one life at a time, one small crowd at a time. I'm not talking about making Americans out of anyone. I'm talking about making them citizens of heaven, children of God. I'm talking about leading them to, to hope in Jesus Christ for salvation. I'm talking about receiving people and helping them to become part of the church. I'm talking about linking ourselves arm in arm with people of every nation under heaven, like they had there in Jerusalem that day, all those nationalities represented. I don't know if I should tell you this or not. I, I don't want you to think I'm flaky or anything, but I just have to live with myself, so you might as well share the joy. I had a dream last night about this because I was praying about this message as I fell asleep. And I had a dream that the church had grown and, and we needed a new building. 
And so we went across town and we found a bigger building. In fact, it was a whole complex of buildings, but it was really run down and, and needed a lot of maintenance, needed a lot of repairs. And I was talking to a group of our men, uh, kind of huddled up in a corner, and, and they were asking why. Specifically, it was Dane Conant. He was in the group, and he said, why? why? Why do we want to do this? I don't know why. It's just That's who it was, though. It was Dane. And he said, why do we need to do this? And I said, well, because there's so many more people we could reach, and, and we could fill this place up. And, and those guys stayed by themselves, and they were discussing this. And I went into a short hallway and turned right and then turned left, and I found myself in like... Uh, a gymnasium, and off that gym, there was another room, uh, like a coach's meeting room, okay? And in that room, there was a, uh, a handful of pastors who used to be the pastor of that facility, and, and they were listening to all of our people on the outside talking. They, they had it wired up, and they were hearing what we were saying on the outside. And I said, you're kind of getting the lowdown on us, aren't you? And they said, well, yeah, I guess you found out. And then some of their people came out from another room, and they were all there, well, a group of about 20, uh, 20 Hispanics or so, and they were standing there, and I said, you know what? We don't need just a bigger building. I said, what we ought to do is just link arm in arm and build God's kingdom, us and you together. And they liked that idea, and I told our people outside, and they liked that idea. And it's like the church just kept growing and growing and growing. I guess I had that dream because I was just thinking about the Holy Spirit coming and just wanting us to take the gospel to people everywhere, to every nation under the sun. That's what I think we ought to do. Paul, Paul said this. He was writing to, to uh, Timothy. He said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which was dwelt in, in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm convinced it's in you as well. Your sincere faith, it's in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us, given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, folks, if we have anything that the world needs today, it's our testimony, what really did happen to us, about the Lord Jesus Christ and how He lives in us. Or be ashamed of me, His prisoner. The testimony of our Lord that God loved the lost, broken, sinful people of this world so much that he, he sent His one and only Son to die in our place. That whosoever, it doesn't matter how lost you are, how broken you are, how sinful you are, whoever believes in Him would have eternal life. Paul went on to say, instead, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Sometimes I don't know if, if Americans can join him in being inconvenienced, much less in suffering. Someone took your parking space. Somebody took your seat. Some, somebody's in the chair you, you've always been in. Maybe they're different. Maybe they've taken up so much of your time. Maybe they speak a different language. That's okay. They've come to Jesus. The Holy Spirit has drawn them. And, and, and it's our job. It's our, it's our duty. It's, it's our joy to share with them the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we're all suffering to some degree, if you can use that word. But in fact, this is what Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 3. If you happen to suffer... For doing what's right, you are blessed. Isn't that awesome? We don't see it as a blessing, but you're being Jesus to this world. You're, you're filling a slot. You're blessed, but do not be terrified. In, in some translations say this, and I, like, I think it's better. Or do not fear what they fear or be shaken, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and minds. No matter what else happens, you just make up your mind, set it in your heart, Jesus Christ is Lord. Come what may, that's a fact. Make up your minds that He is still in control, that He still reigns. And through His Holy Spirit, who indwells His church, He's here and working today. Do that. And to do that, we have to be empowered by the love of Christ and the mind of Christ 
to do the things that Jesus does. The world needs you, you who are full of the Holy Spirit. When you read the headlines and things are just going terrible, you just say next time you hear it, they need us. Not that they need us, but they need us to be full of the Holy Spirit so we can work affecting God's work and will in their life and blessing and healing and helping. They need us terribly bad. I'd like for you to bow your heads. We're going to pray just a short prayer and and ask God to fill us. It'd be a shame to go home without receiving what we need to help our world today. Father, we We've been saved, yes, and we were claimed and born again and, and became spiritual beings in your kingdom. But, Lord, sometimes we just need to be filled again. This happened with your apostles in the book of Acts. They came and they met together and they prayed, and again the place was shaken, and again they were filled again with the Holy Spirit, and that happened many times. And in our lives still today, we have to be filled again and again because we're broken vessels, because we're still human. We're not absolutely perfect. No, Lord, we need your touch over and over again. So to that soul who's really running on empty right now, would you fill them again? Would you come in your power and your might and your blessing and your sweetness in your own gentle way and fill our hearts again? Give us the words to say to a broken world. And may people be amazed and wonder and have to credit God and not us because you're doing wonderful things among us. Speak to our hearts this week. Give us the, uh, the anointing of God that brings power and joy and confidence and a message for the people around us. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here.